Welcome to Wealthy Experts, where we interview experts in their field so we can learn all the best ways, tools, and tips that they use to build a wealthy life. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome, everybody, to another Wealthy Podcast. Today, we have my business partner, Peter Esho. Um, Pete, thanks for jumping on the show today. Hey, Tom, great to be back again with you. I've, I've missed this. So it's so good to be back chatting again. Well, the thing is, not everyone is as lucky as me. I get to talk to you every morning and we bounce a lot of ideas off one another. For me, it's especially valuable because you're, you're basically an economist, you're a philosopher, you, you sharpen your mind against a lot of the best minds in the industry. A lot of the people that you're talking to are heads of industry working in major banks and they are economists, they are trading large quantities of stocks and derivatives all sorts of really exciting stuff and i guess you've got a very good global perspective as well so today what i wanted to talk to you about is some of the macroeconomics some of the bigger slower moving things that are happening behind the scenes or even at the forefront that uh, will be impacting property prices Cool. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for a very generous introduction, Don. No worries, man. So the way that I think about real estate, and I guess you're the same as the same as you, is it's that balance between supply and demand. And then demand is really impacted by a few key things. You say this often. It's policy decisions. So what the government decides to do, um, the cost of capital. So what you can go and get debt, and how much, how easy money is flowing around the system. Um, and then also, you know, those two are the, re- they're the two really big things, but then there's also population. How many people are coming into the country? How many people are moving into an area? That's, they're the really big um, determinants of demand. So, sure. I mean, starting at the top, you know, thinking about what's happening in politics around the corner, we've got an election. Is there anything that you're seeing from either of the two parties that you think are big, scary, scary policy decisions that will upend or change the property market? No, not at all, Dom. I think both political parties in Australia are very scared to come out with policies. Uh, They want to play it really safe. We have a coalition government that's been in for quite a while. Um, there's a there's a mood for change and the opposition doesn't really want to rattle rattle things. It wants to cruise in and not put too much risk on the table. And while politically that might be good, it's not really um, good policy because I think who misses out is the country. We need policy. We've had a policy void because a lot of our policy, fiscal policy has been drained by COVID, the COVID response. And now it's time to rebuild. Now it's time to get our books back in order And we have some very big issues, very big social issues. Uh, You and I are very fortunate that we we run a business that's in real estate and we help people invest in real estate every day. But there are a lot of people in our community and our society that have a lot of pain and anxiety around real estate. They can't afford to buy a house. They're struggling to pay their rents. And we, we need to address that because that's bad for everybody. It's bad for our society. It's bad for investors. It's bad for homeowners. We need to make sure that we have a country that has adequate, affordable housing and that benefits everybody. So hopefully post-election, we do get some policy around that. But so far, nobody's coming to the table with enough courage to address that. Yeah, look, the only thing that that was really come to the surface is the first home buyer incentives, you know, limiting smaller deposits. Um, from my perspective, all that really does is add pressure. It increases demand for real estate. It puts further pressure on pushing prices upward. I mean, limiting the deposit that people can get in. So having a 2 3 5% deposit to get in just means that um, certainly more people can get into property, but it just pushes the prices further away. And if you're a real estate owner, it's great for us. Yeah. And unfortunately, if you're a tenant who can't or is not in a position to borrow money to borrow 98 percent and buy a home you miss out Um, if you're a retiree that has been hit by covid business economically whatever you miss out so while there is policy you're exactly right there is policy to encourage home ownership and that's great 
there needs to be more. That's not enough. That's sort of one tool in an overall toolbox that we need. Because Dom, when you have unaffordable housing, it makes your employment market unsustainable. People don't want to come to Australia and work here because it just costs too much. You take from one hand and you bleed out the other. It makes running a business difficult because you know, your employees are uncomfortable or have pressure that they bring and that anxiety that they bring along with them. And so it's a, it's a social issue uh, that needs to be addressed. You're exactly right. We've got a demand driver, but we don't have anything on the supply side. And that's where I think the biggest risk is at the moment. Let's talk about that rather than doing all demand and supply. Let's sort of bounce around a little bit because uh, these topics as you'll appreciate, all of these forces really impact one another. Um, supply is one of the biggest things that is impacting price at the moment. It's um, largely unspoken about. A lot of people are not aware about the supply side constraints that we're facing in the real estate industry. Just because they think that, hey, you know, I can go buy property out in the market, like there's not, not, not that big an issue. But for us, we're talking to developers, we're talking to builders, we're at the cold face, landowners, and what have been some of your experiences with the, these people trying to bring supply to the market? What's the data telling us? It's amazing. Um, supply has been disrupted in everything, everywhere, not just in housing. So if you have a look at things like the used car market, it's up, you know, 35, 40%. If you have a look at, you know, furniture flipping uh, on Facebook Marketplace, it's up. Um, and these things are all up. The things that normally go down in value, electronics, for example, you know, all these things that we're used to seeing going down in value over time that aren't going down, it's really in response to a big supply shock, which you and I have spoken about in previous podcasts. And last year, you know, when we were talking about it, we were talking about something transitory. At some point, factories will come back again and, things will go back to normal. It now seems like that's going to take a long time or it's going to take longer than what people are anticipating. And so when you take a building industry, when you take Australia, for example, which is an island that requires you know, us to import a lot of material and a lot of that supply chain um, needs to come from overseas, there's a big disruption to the way that builders build homes. Compound that with labour. We've got a very tight labour market. And while the government is out there, you know, beating its chest and telling everybody how low unemployment is, the reality is the unemployment rate is down because a lot of people have left the job market. A lot of people that were previously here to work have left Australia. Um, and so that means that you have less labor. So it costs more to employ somebody and it costs more for building material. What's gonna to happen to the cost of building a house or an apartment or townhouses or anything? the cost of creating anything is going up and houses are the most expensive things that we create in our economy. Really, really good point. And, you know, yeah, we are an island, but even if we weren't, look, energy prices are going up. You know, people say, well, what's the, in it's the butterfly effect, the war over in Europe and Ukraine, you know, all the energy being locked in, in the Russia has meant that energy prices are going up. And it's just made it way more difficult. That cost of bringing a piece of wood on a bar, on a on a um a boat, then on a on a truck, and then getting it to the site has gone up. Not to mention that everybody is competing for that same piece of wood because um, house prices have gone up. You know, our experiences with Brisbane, a lot of people are being hit with variations because they've signed build contracts that were two hundred thousand 250,000 to build a home the average build price now is sort of 350 to 450 so there's a huge change in the price of property the developers that we're talking to day to day many don't have just said this and we're not we're, we're not going to put any more projects up because we need build costs to stabilize before we feel comfortable putting a price on the property so from our perspective on the cold face to all of you out there, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really painting itself to be difficult to stock is hard to come by. 
it's really mm. hard to come by. And when there's limited supply, um, that has an impact on property prices. Yeah, that's the biggest issue at the moment, supply. And we're a growing country. I mean, we're only 25 odd million people. And for us to grow, for us to prosper, for our economy to grow, for us to pay off our debt, we need people, which was the first point that you started the podcast on, the demographics. And people need houses, you know, people need places to live. So we're going to have to be building uh, for a very long time. And so I think the biggest risk at the moment is that we're not going to be building enough um, to, to meet current demand or to meet natural demand. And what that's going to mean, Dom, is that there's going to be pressure on rents. Um, there's going to be upward pressure of rents. People are going to find it very difficult. And as an investor, that's okay. So if you put your investor hat on and you're buying real estate, interest rates might be going up. But if you're an investor, that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing um, because it means that your rents are going up. And it means that the cost of everything in the economy is going up. So the replacement value of what you're buying is, is going up. Interest rates going up are a sign of a healthy economy. Interest rates going down are a sign of an economy that's in trouble, that's wobbly. Um, and so what we're going through, Dom, is we're going through a real estate market now that has been good to owner occupiers to a real estate market that's no good for owner occupiers, but much better for investors because you've got low uh, unemployment, people have jobs and they're able to go and buy real estate, which is limited in supply because there isn't much more being created, at least not for the next five or so years based on what we spoke about. And they're able to get more rent. Um, and so the real estate market's shifting massively towards investors. You've hit some really important points there, Peter. Um... You know, one of the big things that I've been seeing recently and a lot of clients and customers talking to me are saying or there's fear and confusion around interest rates going up. And one thing you said on previous pod podcasts was that we're going from really, really, really low interest rates, basically zero to really, really low interest rates. And, you know, interest rates going up isn't a bad thing if you know what to do and how to respond to them. So I want to talk about that a little bit more because I saw an interesting article by the RBA saying if interest rates go up to two, up 2%, two we could see a 15% shock in prices and prices of property might come back 15%. You and I have read articles like this for the past 15, 20 years. What are some of your comments on interest rates going up and then a 15% shock in prices going backwards? Do you see that discounting in the market? Uh, I think people mark real estate with one brush and really what you have in real estate is you have different markets. For example, in the stock market, BHP, Commonwealth Bank and Tesla are in different markets. They're in different pools. You know, one's a US company and that's valued on US assumptions. One's an Australian bank that, that operates domestically. So in the real estate market, you also have these segments, these buckets. Um, and the two most obvious uh, are owner occupiers and investors. And the, every time the Reserve Bank, every time government bodies, OECD, every time you see the headline in a newspaper, warning and cautioning, they're usually doing that for the owner occupier. Because the owner occupier goes out, borrows money, and has no income. They subsidize that from their salary, right? You go out, you work, you make money, you pay your mortgage. So when interest rates go up, I can't, it's hard for me, uh, or I've got to be really good and a really good job to go and get more money from my boss straight away. I might be able to do that over a year or two, but we don't have, you know, uh, often salary increases. They happen in blocks. And so there's caution. When interest rates rise, the owner occupiers, particularly those that have gone and bought emotionally, bought a house for one or $2 million um, and borrowed at 2% and they haven't thought about 5 or 6%, they get caught. And that's where you see selling. That's where you see pressure. And I think that's where you could see Dom 15, 20%. However, the investors are able to go and get more rents. And so people are selling their houses because rates are going up and they borrow too much money, they might enter the rental market for a short period of time until they get their finances back in order. And so we need to distinguish 
uh, these two buckets. And you're right. We always hear, you know, every year, every month, there's always a sensational story out there about how the market could fall. But you and I sit back and say, which market? And then within the market, which segment? And let's go and see what that means. 100%. It's, it's, um, it's a familiar conversation to a rational head. And when you really segment it and look at the details, median house price in Sydney is like one and a half million dollars. That's a big price, you know? And you have to have a look at what parts of the market would be most heavily impacted by a 30 or 50% increase in interest rates. Owner occupiers are very susceptible to shocks because inflation goes up, that impacts the cost of vegetables or fuel. If mum doesn't go back to work, that's an income that you're not that you're losing. Um, interest rates go up, that's another expense. So inflation impacts an owner occupier very, very heavily. Whereas if you've got an investment property, you ratchet up the rent. Plus, you get all the depreciation. Plus, yes. you get all of the tax incentives that come from you know, uh, using the, uh, uh, um, the expenses, you can offset your income. So you, you, you really are sitting in a much prettier position if you can go and buy and look for affordability, buy within your means and look for good income producing assets where you've got a strong long-term growth strategy. I mean, how often are we saying this? I feel like it feels silly saying it all the time, but it needs to be addressed because there's a lot of fear in the market, right? There's a lot of fear. There's always going to be a lot of fear. You can watch this video in 10 years time and I guarantee you, you'll be able to go and find a voice in the market that's cautioning you around house prices collapsing. And I can guarantee you that when you do watch this in 10 years time, real estate prices overall are going to be much higher than what they are as of the time of this recording. So it's about taking that caution, but then compartmentalizing it and deciding what does this actually mean for me? In the same way that, you know, we get cautioned not to smoke cigarettes, not to eat too much sugar, not to speed, not to do a lot of things. Uh, we need to take that and put it into context and figure out if I'm a healthy person and I'm doing the right thing, then that smoking warning shouldn't freak me out, right? I shouldn't be freaked out if somebody's smoking around me or whatever. You've got to take risks in the right context and figure out what they mean for you and for your situation. Agreed. I always use the metaphor that debt is like fire. You know, you can use it to cook your dinner or to burn your house down. And, mm. you know, if it's used properly, you can advance civilizations. If it's used irresponsibly, you know, the soul city will go up in flames. So it's, it's one of those things that if you understand the mechanism, if you've offset the debt against some income, there's a lot of really good creative ways that you can make money in all of these markets. Now, Pete, I know that you're busy. So I just want to finish up on a couple of key points. Um, what are you looking at? What's, what's interesting to you? What sort of grabbed your attention? What sort of the stuff that you're percolating around at the moment in your mind? I think for me, it's back to basics, Dom. And the last podcast that you and I had together, at the end, I cautioned against crypto. Um, I went out and said, now's a good time to reevaluate what this whole crypto exposure means to you. NFTs, cryptos, they're great technology. But if you're overexposed, take some of that money off the table. And in hindsight, that's aged really well. Um, one of the things that's on my mind a lot is something that you open the podcast about and that's demographics. Uh, the older I get, the, the um, hopefully wiser I get, not always, my wife won't, won't agree with that. But the older I get, the more I tend to appreciate that demographics dictates everything. Um, and if there's one thing you wanna focus on as an investor in anything, it's demographics. Because take Sydney, for example, it's the most expensive real estate market in Australia because it's the one that grows by the most population. It's the one that has the demographics in its favor. And then you take a regional market, name any regional market, and it's probably struggled for a very long time because the demographics haven't been there. And so everything is dominated by demographics. And if you understand the demographics and you understand what's happening with the movement of people 
the birth of people, then that will, that's a good guide to dictate how you invest. And so my parting advice is always invest in the highest quality demographic story that you can find. Really, really agree with that. That's been the fundamental pillar of all of my investment decisions. Look at the gross numbers, but dive into the details. Looking at the demographics is so, so powerful. It's great to see that a thousand people have moved to an area, but what are those thousand people? What's it comprised of? Are they about, are they pre-retirees and then their incomes are going down or are they 25 to 45 where their incomes are going up? Are they building families? So what is the demographics and what's its composition is one of the most powerful things you can use when you're investing in real estate. And I'm going to go blue in the face saying this, but the <laughs> Melbourne market to me is one of the most powerful demographic stories I've seen. Um, migration coming back into the country is going to be massively impactful. And the two big winners of that are Sydney and Melbourne. So look, Pete, thank you very much for jumping on the show today. Short and sweet. I um, always appreciate these conversations. Um, I want to ask one last question. Cool. What are you doing with your investments? What's, how are you investing your money? And how are you, what are you doing with your property? Uh, Dom, I sold some commercial real estate last year. So I took some money off the table while the market was good. Um, I may have got an extra 10 or 15%, but that's okay. Um, and so this year for me is consolidating the portfolio. I'm looking at the things I have in my portfolio and how I can add value to them. I'm being really patient. Um, I'm fortunate that I built my portfolio over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, if I hadn't, I'd be using this market to actually go out and add one or two more investment properties using this, you know, sentiment that's coming off, um, you know, people starting to panic a little bit. Have I missed the market? Have I missed the top? Um, so I'm looking at those opportunities. I'm getting my portfolio in order and adding some more value I'm building at the moment um, on some underutilized land. Um, but I'm looking to buy. Um, I, I, was, I was taking my foot off the pedal when the market was hot. And if the market, I'm waiting for the market to soften so I can dive in again. Mm, yeah, I agree. I've, um, I was lucky to make some good investments early on in the piece um, with some properties that a lot of the market wouldn't have thought to purchase. I bought a whole bunch of units and they've performed really, really well for me. So I'm thinking about um, consolidating, selling some of that, those early investments um, and buying an own home, which is against a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. But um, not every decision needs to be based in investments. Part of it is emotional. I've got little Leonardo there. Charlotte is, you know, wanting a backyard and, and wanting some of that security. So, you know, I feel very blessed that my early investment decisions have now given me the equity that I need to come back from Nelson Bay, back into the Sydney market, to buy a house that I want. Um, and, you know, I'm also like you, uh, spending a bit of money to reinvest in some of the other assets that I've got. And I'm actually doubling down on some other commercial stuff. So yeah, like you, um, moving some of the pieces of the pie around to sort of suit what's happening with our personal life. Um, Pete, thanks for, jump, thanks for jumping on the show today. Um, thanks, any Tom. parting words we we finish up? No, parting words are, um, I think, you know, to your point that you just made about providing for your family and giving yourself a lifestyle, I think ultimately that's the most important thing because we talk about investments, we talk about income, we talk about, you know, a lot of different things that are number driven, but ultimately you have to live your life, you have to be content and happy. And, you know, that's what being wealthy is all about. Agreed. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. And that's a good message for all of you. Um, you know, we at Wealthy, we go out, we invest, we make property investment easy, but our investments are there to serve us and our lifestyle. So happy investing, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Share, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff and have an awesome week. We'll see you all soon.